While the law of success philosophy was in the embryonic stage, long before it had been organized into a systematic course of instruction and reduced to textbooks, the author was lecturing on this philosophy in a small town in Illinois. One of the members of the audience was a young life insurance salesman who had but recently taken up that line of work. After hearing what was said on the subject of imagination, he began to apply what he had heard to his own problem of selling life insurance. Something was said during the lecture about the value of allied effort, through which men may enjoy greater success by cooperative effort through a working arrangement under which each boosts the interests of the other. Taking this suggestion as his cue, the young man in question immediately formulated a plan whereby he gained the cooperation of a group of businessmen who were in no way connected with the insurance business. Going to the leading grocer in his town, he made arrangements with that grocer to give a $1,000 insurance policy to every customer purchasing no less than $50 worth of groceries each month. He then made it a part of his business to inform people of this arrangement and brought in many new customers. The grocery man had a large, neatly lettered card placed in his store informing his customers of this offer of free insurance, thus helping himself by offering all his customers an inducement to do all their trading in the grocery line with him. This young life insurance man then went to the leading gasoline-filling station owner in the town and made arrangements with him to insure all customers who purchased all their gasoline, oil, and other motor supplies from him. Next he went to the leading restaurant in the town and made a similar arrangement with the owner. Incidentally, this alliance proved to be quite profitable to the restaurant man, who promptly began an advertising campaign in which he stated that his food was so pure, wholesome, and good that all who ate at his place regularly would be apt to live much longer. Therefore, he would insure the life of each regular customer for $1,000. The life insurance salesman then made arrangements with a local builder and real estate man to insure the life of each person buying property from him, for an amount sufficient to pay off the balance due on the property in case the purchaser died before payments were completed. The young man in question is now the general agent for one of the largest life insurance companies in the United States, with headquarters in one of the largest cities in Ohio and his income now averages well above $25,000 a year. The turning point in his life came when he discovered how he might make practical use of the law of imagination. There is no patent on his plan. It may be duplicated over and over again by other life insurance men who know the value of imagination. Just now, if I were engaged in selling life insurance, I think I should make use of this plan by allying myself with a group of automobile distributors in each of several cities, thus enabling them to sell more automobiles and at the same time providing for the sale of a large amount of life insurance through their efforts. Charles Chaplin makes a million dollars a year out of a funny shuffling walk and a pair of baggy trousers because he does something different. Take the hint and individualize yourself with some distinctive idea. Financial success is not difficult to achieve after one learns how to make practical use of creative imagination. Someone with sufficient initiative and leadership and the necessary imagination will duplicate the fortunes being made each year by the owners of five and ten cent stores by developing a system of marketing the same sort of goods now sold in these stores with the aid of vending machines. This will save a fortune in clerk hire, insure against theft, and cut down the overhead of store operation in many other ways. Such a system can be conducted just as successfully as food can be dispensed with the aid of automatic vending machines. The seed of the idea has been here sown. It is yours for the taking. Someone with an inventive turn of the mind is going to make a fortune and at the same time save thousands of lives each year by perfecting an automatic railroad crossing control that will reduce the number of automobile accidents on crossings. The system, when perfected, will work somewhat after this fashion. A hundred yards or so before reaching the railroad crossing, the automobile will cross a platform somewhat on the order of a large-scale platform used for weighing heavy objects and the weight of the automobile will lower a gate and ring a gong. This will force the automobile to slow down. After the lapse of one minute, the gate will again rise and the car may continue on its way. 
Meanwhile, there will have been plenty of time for observation of the track in both directions to make sure that no trains are approaching. Imagination, plus some mechanical skill, will give the motorist this much-needed safeguard and make the man who perfects the system all the money he needs and much more besides. Some inventor who understands the value of imagination and has a working knowledge of the radio principle may make a fortune by perfecting a burglar alarm system that will signal police headquarters and at the same time switch on lights and ring a gong in the place about to be burglarized with the aid of apparatus similar to that now used for broadcasting. Any farmer with enough imagination to create a plan, plus the use of a list of all automobile licenses issued in his state, may easily work up a clientele of motorists who will come to his farm and purchase all the vegetables he can produce and all the chickens he can raise, thus saving him the expense of hauling his products to the city. By contracting with each motorist for the season, the farmer may accurately estimate the amount of produce he should provide. The advantage to the motorist accruing under the arrangement is that he will be sure of direct from the farm produce at less cost than he could purchase it from local dealers. The roadside gasoline filling station owner can make effective use of imagination by placing a lunch stand near his filling station and then doing some attractive advertising along the road in each direction, calling attention to his barbecue, homemade sandwiches, or whatever else he may wish to specialize on. The lunch stand will cause the motorists to stop, and many of them will purchase gasoline before starting on their way again. These are simple suggestions involving no particular amount of complication in connection with their use, yet it is just such uses of imagination that bring financial success. The Piggly Wiggly self-help store plan, which made millions of dollars for its originator, was a very simple idea which anyone could have adopted, yet considerable imagination was required to put the idea to work in a practical sort of way. The more simple and easily adapted to a need an idea is, the greater is its value, as no one is looking for ideas which are involved with great detail or in any manner complicated. Imagination is the most important factor entering into the art of selling. The master salesman is always one who makes systematic use of imagination. The outstanding merchant relies upon imagination for the ideas which make his business excel. Imagination may be used effectively in the sale of even the smallest articles of merchandise, such as ties, shirts, hosiery, etc. Let us proceed to examine just how this may be done. I walked into one of the best-known haberdasheries in the city of Philadelphia for the purpose of purchasing some shirts and ties. As I approached the tie counter, a young man stepped forward and inquired, Is there something you want? Now, if I had been the man behind the counter, I would not have asked that question. He ought to have known by the fact that I had approached the tie counter that I wanted to look at ties. I picked up two or three ties from the counter, examined them briefly, then laid down all but one light blue which somewhat appealed to me. Finally, I laid this one down also and began to look through the remainder of the assortment. The young man behind the counter then had a happy idea. Picking up a gaudy-looking yellow tie, he wound it around his fingers to show how it would look when tied, and asked, Isn't this a beauty? Now, I hate yellow ties, and the salesman made no particular hit with me by suggesting that a gaudy yellow tie is pretty. If I had been in that salesman's place, I would have picked up the blue tie for which I had shown a decided preference and I would have wound it around my fingers so as to bring out its appearance after being tied. I would have known what my customer wanted by watching the kinds of ties that he picked up and examined. Moreover, I would have known the particular tie that he liked best by the time he held it in his hands. A man will not stand by a counter and fondle a piece of merchandise which he does not like. If given the opportunity, any customer will give the alert salesman a clue as to the particular merchandise which should be stressed in an effort to make a sale. I then moved over to the shirt counter. Here I was met by an elderly gentleman who asked, Is there something I can do for you today? Well, I thought to myself that if he ever did anything for me it would have to be today, as I might never come back to that particular store again. I told him I wanted to look at shirts and describe the style and color of shirt that I wanted. The old gentleman made quite a hit with me when he replied by saying, I am sorry, sir, but they are not wearing that style this season, so we are not showing it. 
I said I knew they were not wearing the style for which I had asked, and for that very reason, among others, I was going to wear it, providing I could find it in stock. If there is anything which nettles a man, especially that type of man who knows exactly what he wants and describes it the moment he walks into the store, it is to be told that they are not wearing it this season. Such a statement is an insult to a man's intelligence, or to what he thinks is his intelligence, and in most cases it is fatal to a sale. If I were selling goods, I might think what I pleased about a customer's taste, but I surely would not be so lacking in tact and diplomacy as to tell the customer that I thought he didn't know his business. Rather, I would prefer to manage tactfully to show him what I believed to be more appropriate merchandise than that for which he had called, if what he wanted was not in stock. One of the most famous and highly paid writers in the world has built his fame and fortune on the sole discovery that it is profitable to write about that which people already know and with which they are already in accord. The same rule might as well apply to the sale of merchandise. The old gentleman finally pulled down some shirt boxes and began laying out shirts which were not even similar to the shirt for which I had asked. I told him that none of these suited, and as I started to walk out he asked if I would like to look at some nice suspenders. Imagine it. To begin with, I do not wear suspenders, and furthermore, there was nothing about my manner or bearing to indicate that I might like to look at suspenders. It is proper for a salesman to try to interest a customer in wares for which he makes no inquiry, but judgment should be used and care taken to offer something which the salesman has reason to believe the customer may want. I walked out of the store without having bought either shirts or ties, and feeling somewhat resentful because I had been so grossly misjudged as to my tastes for colors and styles. A little further down the street I went into a small one-man shop which had shirts and ties on display in the window. Here I was handled differently. The man behind the counter asked no unnecessary or stereotyped questions. He took one glance at me as I entered the door, sized me up quite accurately, and greeted me with a very pleasant, "'Good morning, sir.' He then inquired, which shall I show you first, shirts or ties? I said I would look at the shirts first. He then glanced at the style of shirt I was wearing, asked my size, and began laying out shirts of the very type and color for which I was searching, without my saying another word. He laid out six different styles and watched to see which I would pick up first. I looked at each shirt in turn and laid them all back on the counter, but the salesman observed that I examined one of the shirts a little more closely than the others, and that I held it a little longer. No sooner had I laid this shirt down than the salesman picked it up and began to explain how it was made. He then went to the tie counter and came back with three very beautiful blue ties of the very type for which I had been looking, tied each, and held it in front of the shirt, calling attention to the perfect harmony between the colors of the ties and the shirt. Before I had been in the store five minutes, I had purchased three shirts and three ties, and was on my way with the package under my arm, feeling that here was a store to which I would return when I needed more shirts and ties. I learned afterwards that the merchant who owns the little shop where I made these purchases pays a monthly rental of five hundred dollars for the small store, and makes a handsome income from the sale of nothing but shirts, ties, and collars. He would have to go out of business, with a fixed charge of five hundred dollars a month for rent, if it were not for his knowledge of human nature, which enables him to make a very high percentage of sales to all who come into his store.